Dr. Kim Williams is Chief of the Division of Cardiology at Rush University in Chicago, Illinois. He specializes in cardiology prevention and cardiac imaging. Dr. Williams has served on numerous national committees and boards, including President of the American College of Cardiology, as well as Chairman of the Association of Black Cardiologists. Learn more about Dr. Williams' very impressive background in the description below. I hope you enjoy this interview. Please let me know what you think by commenting below and also be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified of when I post a new video. So, uh, Dr. Williams, I first learned of you back in 2014 when um, you were first named the first vegan and first black president of the American College of Cardiology a 49,000 member organization. Um, I remembered because I had just adopted a vegan diet and I was just super like hyper excited about you coming on board um, and taking on that role, that very important role in the community. Well, thank you. And thank you for the dietary change. You know, they, they laugh, they meaning the non-vegan people, they sort of laugh at us and um, talking about how much evangelism we do. Um, so you are affecting the people around you in a positive way. So thanks for that. Oh, I appreciate you saying that. So um, today I really want to dive into the topic of high blood pressure or hypertension. Um, hypertension has been described as a silent killer. Can you just describe or define what is hypertension and then how does lifestyle contribute to it? So let's talk about uh, what, what is a high blood pressure or hypertension. First of all, there's two different systems. There's pulmonary hypertension, which hopefully no one will ever see. Yeah, we see it all the time, unfortunately, uh, when the valves go bad, when the lungs are bad, it gets scarred over the pressures inside the lungs. And that can really hurt the heart and it can make for a very short life expectancy. And there are newer, fancier drugs that can try to keep people alive. Um, but fortunately, uh, when someone hears you know, the word hypertension, you kind of have to know, is it the body or the systemic? or is it the lungs, the pulmonary? Um, now, the systemic hypertension is, is what most people are talking about when they say high blood pressure. And that really is, an, is a combination of how much your arteries are squeezing, how hard your heart is pumping, and how much volume you have in your system. And we have some conditions that can mess up all of those, <laughs> such as uh, eating a, a high sodium, uh, meal uh, can actually raise your blood pressure. And we use that at times to the benefit of a patient. You know, you give them a liter of saline and the blood pressure comes up, right? Well, we also um, unfortunately have a lot of hormonal effects, such as the adrenaline levels that happen when someone is supposed to be under a flight or fight uh, scenario, but instead they're living under stressful conditions all the time. People who are overweight, people who have um, sleep apnea can have an elevation in their, um, their adrenaline levels, but also their cortisol levels. And those um, elevations will squeeze on blood vessels, uh, make you absorb fluid, fluid and hold on to it and raise the blood pressure. So um, does genetics play a role in blood pressure or hi hypertension? It does, um, in that every human has 23, uh, 23 times two, 46 chromosomes. Uh, we're all human. I just wanted to say homo sapiens. And there are, there are no people who will not be hypertensive if you give them the, the, uh, the right circumstance. Now, when people think that African Americans inherited high blood pressure. There may be a hair of truth to it. If you go back and you imagine, just imagine slave ships coming from West Africa to the New World. And they were horrific conditions and there wasn't a lot of water and there was a lot of death. Who was able to survive that? People who were naturally able to conserve sodium, okay, made it more likely that they would survive that trip. Right. And so if, the, if you then uh, give people unlimited amounts of sodium and they're already genetically pre-programmed uh, from their ancestry to conserve sodium, perhaps that can create the scenario of more of a genetic hypertension. But, you know, I've been doing, as you mentioned, plant-based nutrition, been doing it for a long time, not just personally, but, uh, well, I might as well say personally. So 
being that under stress, uh, as we like to say, would have been my freshman year of medical school. Yeah, I was at University of Chicago, but in college, let's be honest, I was a tennis player and I would study and I got good grades, but I was a tennis player. And so I'm running around playing tournaments, studying in between, no, well, medical school, that's for real, <laughs> okay? All of a sudden it is real. And you're, you're studying like crazy, trying to you know, keep up and stay ahead. Uh, the, the reading material that you can't get around, you can't fake your way through it. And so, and so all of a sudden my blood pressure was 140 over 90, like everybody else in my family. Now, um, I, of course, I had a physiology book and I read it and it said sodium, you decrease the sodium in your diet and your blood pressure will go down. I did that, blood pressure went down to 128. Okay, fast forward 20 years in my you know, upper 40s, and um, I went completely plant-based, my blood pressure went to 104. Mm -hmm. So regardless of my genetics, it's nutrition that we should be paying attention to. And so we have that in our guidelines. Um, I was fortunate to be on the ACCAHA 2017 guideline writing group, and we really took it on the chin of people criticizing us, saying we were in the pocket of industry because we changed the definition of high blood pressure down to 130 um, and, uh, and 120 above 120 is elevated and that we should be treating people to 130. And they said, it was just absolutely terrible. And we we're trying to you know, give all these drugs. That means they didn't read the document. We weren't talking about drugs. We were talking about dynamic exercise, isometric resistance exercise, um, absolutely decreasing the sodium to less than 1500 milligrams a day, more potassium in the diet. That's a way of saying a, a vegetarian diet, unless you get a salt substitute and pour it all over your food, getting that to 3500 milligrams a day, losing weight, cutting down the alcohol and doing mostly plant-based nutrition. And if you put all those together, you actually get a, cumul a cumulative effect on your blood pressure of 30 to 40 millimeters which, uh, of mercury, which means that most people, if they do the lifestyle correctly, most people should not have to go on medications. So there was a study published in 2018 that showed that 75% um, or three out of four black adults will ad develop hypertension by the age of 55 compared to 55% of white men and 40% of white women. Why yep. are the why are there higher rates of hypertension among Blacks compared to other racial groups? You know, African Americans do not have uh, overall a higher amount of drinking, but we have a fair number of heavy drinkers, okay? And the heavy drinking does contribute to this. But the amount of sodium, saturated fat, high cholesterol um, in the diet, uh, particularly uh, fried foods, these are actually foods that increase the blood pressure, and that's what we eat. Now, why do we eat such a poor diet? That goes back to slavery as well. And so you're eating so-called so, so low on the hog. And even though, you know, there was 1863, there was a big war. Again, there was a lot of uh, sort of freedom in a way. Uh, obviously, we're seeing that uh, we're, the freedom is not complete. Uh, not in, by any stretch of the imagination, but we can choose what we eat. We can make those choices as opposed to back before 1863, we had a really hard time uh, choosing what to eat. It was starve, not live very long. And you know, when you're talking about eating low on the hog and you're only gonna live 50 years, it's not a big deal. But now we're talking about longevity. That's what we're lacking in the African-American community. If we've improved um, along with medical care, but we haven't done, you know, we haven't kept up with medical care ourselves in terms of changing how we eat and whether or not we're going to have that, you know, mo most of us grow up exercising as African Americans, but really into sports. And then uh, adult time, it starts to slow down unless you're in a, uh, the kind of um, physical labor job and, you know, your mail carrier and you're walking seven miles a day. Most of us do not do that. And so the chair being the new cigarette, we end up with a, a fair amount of poor risk factors um, because of our lifestyle. So it's not 100% nutrition, but a lot of it is. Okay, so diet, exercise, I heard you mentioned stress earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Does sleep play a role in this as, as well? S sleep really does, and sleep is impaired uh, sometimes by stress, sometimes by our lifestyle. But sleep can also be impaired by sleep apnea. And we see a lot of people who have uncontrolled and, or so-called resistant hypertension because they're so overweight that they have 
airway compression uh, at night when the muscles relax and they're laying down. And without getting that detected with a sleep study, uh, getting something that's uh, new around the country, but we do a fair number of them at Rush, uh, have a so-called hypoglossal nerve stimulator, can actually push your tongue forward, get it out of the back of your throat so you're not choking on it. And uh, if, you, if you can stop yourself from stopping breathing, um, that really does lower the blood pressure. So there have been countless studies, even books written around uh, racial disparities in our healthcare system. What disparities have you personally witnessed or experienced um, in your line of work? So they're all, they're everywhere. Um, and the good news is, is that since the, the, since Margaret Heckler in the 1980s, um, who was Secretary of, of Health and Human Services, tried to get uh, a report out about unequal treatment. At least people have been talking about it. And now they're talking about it even more, particularly with all that's going on um, uh, with you know, police brutality and the like. Um, they're talking about all aspects of uh, racial discrimination. And I'm hoping that they'll talk specifically about education because that's where we're lacking uh, the most. That is uh, a system that takes the poorer people and because their tax base, base is poorer, gives them poorer functioning schools, is completely regressive. All it's gonna do is perpetuate poorness and it doesn't help the country. And so, you know, I always like to say when I'm talking to an audience of non-minorities that minority healthcare is a responsibility from everyone, uh, for everyone in the United States because it's one country, no matter how we behave, uh, on Sunday mornings or during demonstrations, it's, it's one country. And we have laws like Imtala. If people are shocked when they hear about Imtala, they just assume it. So Imtala is the Emergency Medical Labor and Treatment Act. If you are a pregnant woman and you go to a hospital, they can't do a wallet biopsy. They have to deliver your baby. That's just the law. And the same thing for any medical emergency. So when an African-American has no access to health care and no, no way of paying for out-of-pocket um, and they don't have insurance, which shouldn't happen anymore after Obamacare, but I know that's being unraveled currently. If you don't have access to adequate health care, or the health care is someone who doesn't follow guidelines because it's a, a lower functioning physician, this is a problem, okay? And you will find that people don't know what the newest guidelines are in terms of medication management. They're giving the wrong drugs. Uh, the example from today's clinic is someone giving a short-acting drug to an obese, morbidly obese African-American woman, even though we know that there's this thing called nocturnal hypertension. Everyone's blood pressure is supposed to go down at night, okay? There are populations that they don't go down. Asians, particularly if they're smokers, obese people, and African-Americans tend not to have the blood pressure go down at night. Well, Suppose you give a, an, a, a drug without looking up the half-life of the drug. It may be commonly used, but it shouldn't be. If it has a two-hour half-life and there's another cousin of it with a similar name that has a 24-hour half-life. So those are the kinds of things, they're knowledge gaps, some of them. And yeah, there are racial biases um, and there's unfamiliarity. And then there's mistrust uh, of uh, certain physicians based on things that have happened in the past. If you roll all that up together and you have a a situation of disaster. Now, you know, we've, I've always tried to focus on the health of the African-American community because I boldly stated when I was uh, ACC incoming president that I wasn't gonna retire until heart disease was the number two killer. It's the number one killer of Americans since 1918, since the Spanish flu epidemic. Well, if I could just get the African-American community to fix the diet, that would take care of it. That we would be number two. We wouldn't have that 21% excess. That's what's really hurting the healthcare system in the United States. It's us and our cardiovascular behavior. So exercise, diet, plant-based nutrition, lose the weight. And guess what? Guess what COVID-19 does? Why is it that African-Americans have more, more COVID-related illnesses and more severity of illness? It's the obesity because uh, the, the coronavirus loves to replicate inside adipose cells. And those fat cells, they just burst, <laughs> unfortunately, with virus. You get more viral load. You infect your family more than, than a, a thin person would be. Uh, the, uh, so you're spreading it. You're getting sicker. 
uh, and the complications are very severe. And so, you know, for a while it was that, yeah, everyone who was dying was obese. Now it's not 100%. There are people who are not obese who are dying, but the odds ratio of getting really, really sick uh, has been published from multiple places, extremely high if you're obese. So the same kinds of things that we've been talking about in, in healthcare and prevention and nutrition for the African-American community are the exact same things that are taking us out with COVID. It's very remarkable. Wow. Okay, so eat a whole food plant-based diet or a largely whole food plant-based diet. Exercise, what, 30 minutes a day, 60 minutes? Uh, no, I was gonna say, you say whole, uh, largely, I was gonna say exclusively. Okay, I, well, I, let's say it, let's say <laughs> it. I, I, you know, I, I have room for error. No, I, no. <laughs> I don't have data against, uh, you know, the Okinawan people who live to be 100 eating three, gra three ounces of fish once a month. I don't have data against that, other than the fish doesn't like it, it's dead as a doornail. Um, but, but, um, but if you could, if you could make it exclusive, you would have a better shot at reversing the diseases. And that's what we've done in our African American Church project. Go in five weeks of completely vegan food. Now, could we have? Did they slip up here and there? Yeah, we had 93% compliance. So I have data up to 93% that all the parameters that we follow for cardiovascular health get better. Um, yeah. So that, that really is what we should be doing, as, as yeah. whole food plant-based as we possibly can. I, I am with you 100%. I will say that I have noticed with some of my clients, when I, when I give them that little out, then they're more inclined to start. And then like once that. they start, they're less afraid to not eat meat. And then they're just like, okay, I can do this. So right. it's the... Uh, <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting that you say that. Um, what, what you're really emphasizing is something that we all should be doing when we're doing any kind of life counseling or medical care. And that is find out the, where the patient is and try to move them along. I, but I do, and I'm one of them. You know, I was, you know, you know those, they had those very famous cookies that became, when they got rid of the lard, they became vegan. And I just love those cookies. And then you get a publication that says that increasing the sugar content has a curvilinear increase in mortality. And then you get another one that says that refined carbohydrates, um, the, those sweets, the, those kinds of things, they're actually worse than eating an animal laden diet. And so you know what I do? 100%, I turn it off. Well, that's because I'm African American, a male, uh, over 60, I know the disease will get me. And so I have that motivation by watching people go through heart disease. So it's easy for me to turn it off. And, and I, there are people like me, but most of the people, they're exactly what you say. You have to gradually bring them to it. You have to work with them uh, because not everybody can turn it off cold turkey without the turkey. Yeah, exactly. That's a great way to put it. So exercise, what's your, what's your recommendation on physical activity? Yes. Okay. So we do have recommendations uh, uh, to try to get uh, 150 minutes in. Um, don't tell my patients that because I always tell them 300. Okay. Um, so 150 is in our prevention guidelines. When I'm treating a disease, I want 45 minutes a day at least. Okay. And that would be 300. And so, um, you know, you really can't, but I don't want to minimize any kind of activity people who are doing occupational um, type of exercise that does count. I like it better if you're doing high intensity stuff, so you should be sweating up. That's not something you generally do at work, um, but sometimes you can. Um, but not being in a chair, just being active is actually better than not being active. So, you know, so yes, we make our recommendations, but any activity you know, is sort of cumulative. And so um, it, try, try doing uh, the 300 if you're trying to treat obesity, diabetes, hypertension, erectile dysfunction, peripheral artery disease, um, heart attack, stroke, death, all of those things can actually improve dramatically with, um, with more consistent exercise, particularly if you mix in some high intensity exercise. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Williams, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you.